God of War returns with a fresh vision for the series, along with brand new technology powering it. This is a series that has always been known for pushing the technological envelope, and this new game is no exception. And like many of the best first party titles, it's evident that its developer, Santa Monica Studio, has been given the time, talent, and budget necessary to fully realize its ambitious vision. From the smallest details to the most towering of beasts, God of War elevates real-time visuals to new heights while pushing the PlayStation 4 hardware to its absolute limits. So join me as we explore the art and technology behind God of War, check out its performance across both models of PlayStation 4, and sample many of its impressive accomplishments. Let us commence. Right from the title screen, the towering figure of Kratos tells us a lot about the visual evolution from previous God of War games. As the camera pulls in, notice the sweat and wrinkles on his worn brow, the pores across his weathered skin, the veins running across his battered hands and the detail on his beard. As he steps back from the tree, more detail becomes evident. The animation and camera work in harmony to deliver an impact with each and every strike. His clothing appears lifelike and moves and jostles with every swing, and the tree itself is supremely well textured. This is just our first taste of what God of War has to offer, and it's quickly apparent that this is a very different type of game. The God of War series has traditionally focused on distant camera placement, rarely allowing the player to closely observe Kratos in action, but here, the camera never cuts and is always situated just behind his shoulder, and it works. The characters form the foundation of this presentation then. From Kratos himself to his son Atreus, and all the other beings you meet along your journey, God of War is focused on presenting each of them with the utmost detail. Thanks to the game's reliance on physically based rendering, leather, cloth, and fur all appear highly realistic and sit naturally within the world. The all-important hair and beards both look and move as you'd expect with excellent shading and detail right down to individual strands. The denizens that you'll face over the course of the game are similarly well crafted with each one sporting highly refined texture work, shading, and a huge triangle count. Animation plays as important a role as raw detail here and sets a new standard for the series. Attacks connect with and stagger enemies realistically now, everything from tossing an axe at the head of a large creature causing him to stumble, to swooping up the undead with vicious attacks lends a sense of weight and momentum to the game. Larger enemies also make an appearance in God of War featuring both excellent cinematic and in-game animation. Clothing and dangly bits also receive their own attention to detail, with realistic physics applied to each of them as you run through the world. It really feels as if the armor worn by Kratos is a separate object with its own physics applied to it, rather than something simply attached to his character model. This is of course enhanced by the inclusion of environmental destruction and interaction. Early in the game as you face down a powerful foe, every tree and boulder can be smashed apart through your actions. Hulking beasts can wipe out stone pillars and every swing of your axe causes nearby foliage to briefly blow in the direction of your swing. Even more impressive are the cinematic moments which allow for pre-calculated displays of physics and destruction. The system here allows for large-scale destruction, rather similar to what we saw in Gears of War 4 actually. Snow deformation also plays a significant role in several large sequences such as this. While simple texture tricks are used in areas with a light covering of snow, thicker ridges offer full deformation, perhaps a form of adaptive tessellation similar to Rise of the Tomb Raider is in use here. This feature allows players and enemies to carve up realistic paths which remain matted down. Finish a battle in a snowy field and its once pristine surface is reduced to mush. Everything is backed by an excellent implementation of per object motion blur, a feature which can be adjusted from the options menu should you prefer not using it. But of course regular viewers of the channel should know that I absolutely love it. Now as impressive as all the characters may be, it's the environments which ultimately steal the show here. Early showings of God of War intentionally focused on the gorgeous snowy forests of Midgard, but 
there is so much more here. Compared to previous games in the series, each area is larger and more complex than before. There are now multiple paths which crisscross over one another as you progress, and it's even possible to backtrack in search of missed secrets and passages. It now feels more like a fully explorable world this time as opposed to a series of stages like previous games. The environment artists have focused on extremely fine detail throughout. The base geometry created for the scenery is remarkably dense. From the towering peaks to the smallest details, every inch of the world receives a careful attention to detail. Look closely at any scene and it's easy to appreciate. Every single wooden beam, slab of stone, and snarling tree branches suitably rounded and realistic. This is of course enhanced by excellent texture work. The new, physically based rendering system helps create more natural environments. What this basically means is that light reacts more realistically with different types of materials. Take the stonework for instance, which appears suitably rough with light scattering in more directions than smooth shiny materials like this floor here. Just like we saw with the aforementioned armor bits, things like wood and metal both react differently to the same light source, creating a very realistic scene. And specular highlights are of course used to great effect in combination with these materials to create surfaces which appear highly realistic yet still somewhat fantastical which is a perfect description of the game world. It's a perfect mix of highly realistic scenes combined with a world of fantasy. The leaves and mud puddles here early in the game resemble a forest one might stumble upon in real life, but later environments feel almost otherworldly at times. And this is all backed by a slew of new lighting features, some of which are made possible by the move to a deferred renderer when building the engine. Dynamic lights are used in abundance throughout the experience, for instance, while a certain artifact even allows Kratos himself to shine light in darker areas, which in turn produces shadows from nearby geometry. Real-time lights casting shadows is something used in several scenes throughout the game. And the world itself also has a nice global illumination solution complete with a bounce pass. Basically, when light bounces off of certain materials and colors, that color value is translated to surrounding objects and characters, Something rather visible in this vivid scene, as the crimson red leaves of these trees influences the surrounding materials and characters. Volumetric lighting also plays a significant role here. From piercing light shafts to thick fog, a voxel grid solution is used to lend a sense of fullness and atmosphere to the game. If you look closely in some scenes, when precision is reduced, you can even see the voxel structure used to achieve the effect. This basically allows for long beams of light to pierce the atmosphere and realistically scatter through the air. This is generally an expensive technique, and we were surprised to see it used so heavily throughout the game. Of course, on the flip side, reflections are somewhat limited in many scenes. Very specific areas do rely on a mix of screen space reflections and cube maps, and it works reasonably well, but most other areas make use of approximate cube maps only, which results in reflections that don't match up with the objects that should be reflecting onto the surface. Of course, in specific scenes, key objects can receive non-screen space style reflections, while the surrounding objects do not. Taken together, however, overall scene lighting is a strong point in God of War that helps bring its world to life. Another great feature are its particles. GPU accelerated particles are used in abundance throughout this game. Everything from ashes and sparks during combat to the performing of a door opening ritual results in a gorgeous shower of GPU particles. It's something that was a big deal early on in the generation, but has since been toned down in many other recent games. The fantasy setting of God of War though is a perfect place to showcase such intense pyrotechnics. But really, as you progress through the game, it's the little details that really start to stand out the most. The way light penetrates leaves as it passes through the trees. How crates and objects break apart in the direction of your swing. The water droplets from the log as you hoist it from the river. And the tiny blades of short blowing grass all work together to create a more realistic and visually engaging experience. And that experience is great whether played on a regular PlayStation 4 or the PS4 Pro. But how does God of War take advantage of each one? 
Well, as expected when played on the Pro, God of War uses checkerboard rendering to reach a fixed pixel count of 3840 by 2160. This is certainly one of the finest examples of checkerboard rendering we've seen to date, with a level of clarity that's not too far off from native 4K, at least perceptually. That's the thing about checkerboarding, it's almost akin to something like interlace versus progressive scan. It looks very sharp normally, but when things start to move a lot and you freeze the image, you can certainly see visible artifacts as a result of the technique. During normal gameplay, however, the effect is quite convincing. So how does checkerboard rendering stack up against native 4K? Remember, a single checkerboard frame consists of half the pixels of the complete frame, but what you see is an intelligent reconstruction using two half frames. The PS4 Pro's ID buffer allows you to track changes in each frame, which can be projected into the next frame using vectors. God of War combines this technique with a temporal anti-aliasing solution which helps minimize loss of quality in motion. Native 4K is always going to be superior, of course, but a checkerboard solution can produce good results with reduced rendering cost per frame. So how does it stack up to native 4K? Well, I'll let you decide for yourself by presenting a demonstration. It just so happens that Rise of the Tomb Raider is that perfect demonstration. The high resolution mode on PS4 Pro uses checkerboard rendering to reach a 2160p pixel count, while the Xbox One X version offers a true native 4K option. Look closely at the fine details, and it should give you an idea of how it compares. The Xbox One X version itself also offers a similar checkerboard-like mode when using the enriched option, and this is how that stacks up. What do you think? Ultimately, in the case of God of War, checkerboard rendering makes a lot of sense. It would likely be impossible to render this game at native 4K on the PS4 Pro while maintaining a smooth, stable frame rate, and checkerboarded 2160p offers superior image quality over resolutions like 1620p or 1800p, making it a perfect option. But a second mode is also available on the PS4 Pro, a performance mode. When selected, resolution is reduced to 1080p, but the frame rate is uncapped, allowing for higher performance. How well does it run then? Well, we'll examine both in the performance section later in this video. Then of course there's the base PS4, which expectedly runs at a native 1080p at 30 frames per second. When placed side by side, it quickly becomes evident that the main difference between the two versions is resolution. The Pro offers greatly enhanced image quality, but the rest of the visuals are equivalent. Which makes sense as the extra hardware is instead put to use in massively increasing the pixel count, rather than simply boosting visual quality. The high performance mode then looks on par with the base PS4 version, but obviously with a higher average frame rate, as you'd expect. All versions exhibit nice image quality though, thanks to excellent anti-aliasing, which handles edges and removes temporal artifacts as well. And lastly, texture filtering is of good quality across both machines. And now it's time to discuss performance. Let's begin with the PlayStation 4 Pro version using the high resolution mode. When selected, the frame rate is capped at 30 frames per second to deliver consistent frame times. Unlocked frame rates have been a series staple in the past, and those that prefer this sort of performance can opt for the performance mode. Now, when using the high res mode, the game does a reasonably good job of holding a steady 30 frames per second in most scenes. This battle at the base of the mountain features a large environment with volumetric lighting, plenty of enemies, and particles, yet the system maintains a consistent 30 frames per second throughout the battle. This more complex cinematic animation sequence then also manages to deliver a stable 30 frames per second without any additional hiccups or slowdown. This battle here in the snowy forest then is another good test. Deformable snow covers the terrain. Destructible trees and boulders are scattered throughout the scene, and the enemy himself spawns large particle trails during the battle. There are some drop frames occasionally here, of course, but the general level of performance is stable. Unfortunately, the game is not perfect in this regard throughout. Take this scene. Perhaps the combination of particles and alpha effects within this specific environment is enough to introduce dropped frames here and there. And when Kratos unleashes his rage, the shower of sparks drops the performance even further, just for a moment. These dips manifest as judder, reducing the fluidity of the battle though the average frame rate still remains just around 30 frames per second. Curiously, one of the worst examples I found was right at the beginning of the game. This early battle exhibits noticeable dips below the 30 frames per second line. 
The average frame rate is still just around 29 frames per second, but as you can see for yourself, it is not completely stable. Perhaps the resolution is just high enough in this mode that specific scenes struggle to stay below 33 milliseconds per frame. Thankfully, this is more of an exception than the rule, and most of the game delivers a stable 30 frames per second, but it's certainly not perfect. Which brings us to performance mode. With the reduced resolution and the frame rate cap removed, there is a significant increase in average frame rate. Of course, it should also be clear that a stable 60 frames per second is simply off the table here, and the frame rate is left to run wild instead, with noticeable judder as a result. This would be a perfect use case for something like FreeSync if the system had supported it. What this mode basically delivers then is something more in line with the likes of, say, God of War 3 or Ascension over on the PlayStation 3. The frame rate averages in the mid to upper 40s most of the time during any skirmish, while some of the quieter moments can jump all the way up to 60 frames per second. It's a nice option for those that prefer the fastest possible performance and don't mind the judder you get from uneven frame rates on a 60Hz display. Lastly, there is the base PlayStation 4, which is, of course, capped at 30 frames per second. And here, the level of performance is remarkably similar to the PlayStation 4 Pro when using that console's higher resolution output option. Frame rates do generally hold steady at 30 frames per second during most scenes, but in certain situations, there are performance dips which do reduce fluidity. It's also worth noting that my launch PS4 system exhibits louder than normal fan usage while playing God of War. If it wasn't already clear that the game pushes the hardware, the fan noise would certainly remind you. Keep in mind that fan noise is highly variable between systems, but in this case, the PS4 Pro I tested was rather quiet compared to the thunderous bass system. Ultimately, between the two systems and available options, I prefer the capped 30fps mode using the high resolution option on the Pro. It's a good mix of image quality and stability. It's certainly not quite as consistent as I would have hoped, the occasional dips below 30 FPS can be frustrating, but the overall level of consistency is generally solid. The unlocked performance mode, however, is simply way too variable and unstable for my tastes. The judder detracts more from the experience than occasional dips below 30 FPS, but of course, it's nice that the option is available as this is going to vary from user to user. So what's the overall takeaway then? Well, it's another great example of a first party title reaching new heights in terms of visual fidelity. God of War stands proudly alongside the likes of Horizon Zero Dawn, Uncharted 4 and Gears of War 4, and offers one of the most impressive presentations of the generation. From its remarkable rendering technology to its camera system, which never cuts, enabling a completely seamless experience from start to finish, God of War is a showpiece title. An impressive achievement that demonstrates what can be accomplished with the perfect mix of a great team, lots of development time, and a sizable budget. Plus, they recruited Christopher Judge to voice Kratos. A very wise choice. Indeed. But with that, we've reached the end of this video. Hopefully by now you have developed a better appreciation of what the development team has achieved in God of War. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe to our channel, and follow us over on Twitter. And until next time, this is John signing off.